So I am most grateful to the speakers who accepted my invitation uh, uh, to come uh, to Albuquerque and share their lives and their work with us, which brings me to tonight's uh, uh, star of the evening, literally and figuratively. Uh, star Felice, originally from Washington Heights, New York, another other New Yorkers here. <laughs> hey. <laughs> uh, <laughs> installation artist and healer who currently lives and works on Pongba land in Los Angeles, California. Uh, Star recently completed their MFA in UCLA's Department of Interdisciplinary Studies, so congratulations on that major accomplishment. Thank you. Um, in their multidisciplinary practice, Earth Connection becomes the key to transforming the ruling tenet of colonial doctrines. Disconnect people from their land, and you disconnect them from their power. Building upon their ancestral afro taino lineage of multidimensional healing, Elise employs sound, sculpture, film, and earthworks with techniques of concealment, language, and mapping to transverse the psychic legacies of everyday resistance and world making. Under the moniker of Christusi, they create experimental emotional music. They're also the medicine person and founder behind Botanica Cimarron, which really I'm very excited about this project, a global brand focused on bringing earth healing back to the people. Belize has performed and exhibited nationally and internationally, including at the Kitchen in New York, the Oregon Contemporary in Portland, Oregon, the Horse Hospital in London, the Latinx Project at NYU, Articule in Montreal and Quebec, Canada, and others. They have been awarded numerous fellowships, residencies, and grants, including Acre in Steuben, Wisconsin, uh, Summer Forum for Inquiry and Exchange in Hawaii, Moan Land Grant in LA, the Printed Matter Emerging Artist Publication Grant in New York, and an International Center of Photography Community Fellowship in New York as well. Their work is part of various collections, including the Schomburg Center for Research in Black Culture in New York, the Joan Flash Artist Book Collection in Chicago, and the library at the International Center of Photography in New York. It was important to me as I was uh, planning the speaker series to also make space, not just for a range of voices, but for younger uh, and or emerging artists who are both doing innovative work and uh, who are producing work that fit with uh, the series theme against the grain, work that resists the accepted frameworks value systems, politics. Uh, therefore, I was really <laughs> delighted when I came across Star's work. It seemed like a perfect fit. And when I emailed Star and they accepted the invitation, I was extremely uh, happy about that. Uh, most because of the healing nature, uh, Star's focus on healing practices, I thought would really speak uh, to this community given the interest on things like curandarismo and traditional uh, indigenous healing, spinal healing, that's such a part of the history and culture in this region of the country. Their presentation this evening is titled Simarron Earth, Reimagining Ancestral Pathways in the Healing Arts. Please join me in welcoming Star Feliz. <laughs> Thank you, Ray. That was such a great introduction. Um, good evening, everyone. Oh, you all look so beautiful. Um, ooh, okay. Thank you for having me. Thank you, everyone. Just a note before we start that I usually freestyle when I'm giving presentations. But as I'm kind of naturally a shy person and I get nervous uh, and just kind of tend to bramble or go blank, I tried something new. Um, so I'll be reading <laughs> from something that I wrote and I hope I don't bore anyone. Um, <clears throat> yeah, uh, it's... It's an honor um, to be presenting my work here at UNM on land that, I mean, has such a rich history of, of artists and of healers. Um, 
I want to express gratitude to the Pueblo, the Tiwa, the Piro, and the Diné people of this land, which today I am a guest, um, this be very beautiful, powerful land. And I'm opening this presentation by honoring my ancestral lineages. The people of the underwater caves, the people of the Seba trees, the people of the cosmic serpent mysteries, the people of the Hawar, the skywalking people of tobacco medicine, the people of earth and stone memory, the messenger people of the soul song. My Taino ancestors on Kiskeya Aiti, the original people of the Caribbean, were the first to meet the wrath of Columbus on the shores of what is now called Dominican Republic in Haiti. My African ancestors were stolen from the shores of Benin and brought to Kiskeya Aiti to become the test subjects of what would soon become modern Western slavery. And my Spanish ancestors, who as missionaries shut down their hearts and divine earth connection and hypnotically became agents of a new poison onto the earth. As we can all see the legacies that that has brought today. Some of my enslaved African and Taino ancestors would free themselves from the Spanish colonial empire by fleeing to the Boruco mountains near Barahona to establish sovereign communities. They became known as Cimarrones. So to everyone who might not know what Cimarron means, that's what it means. Over time, we've learned to conceal and to shut down our divine power and technologies in order to survive the ongoing siege of colonialism. These are the beautiful people who raised me. Also, can everyone hear me well? Yeah, okay. My parents had to turn away from their connection to the earth, to their rural lifestyle, and migrate to the belly of the beast, also known as the United States, the same imperial force that occupied our land for many years, to glean safety and freedom. Because being from the land meant being poor and being illiterate and stuck in cycles they didn't have the power to break. I was born and raised in New York City, and although we would take trips back to DR, most of my connection to the island was mediated through family albums, phone calls, my mom's monthly cajas or shipments, and most of all, the stories and remedios I would pick up from my mom and grandmother just from being in the kitchen together. Um, this one here, this is a photo of some of my maternal great aunt and other relatives gathered together. Folk, folk healers are some of my biggest teachers and influences. You may also know them as spirit mediums, medicine women, mystic artists, priestesses, midwives, but in my family, no one retained the title. I only learned through watching them, through listening, and through, channel and through channeling and putting the pieces together over time. My family is very good at keeping secrets. As frustrating as it was for me at times, I see the generational design in this as well. The sacred is protected by its lock of secrets. And this is my grandmother in the kitchen. So many mysteries are kept alive in basements, in El Monte, or in the bushes, in the home, in the kitchen, in symbols, and in silence. The campesinos are the ones carrying on the radical, communal, spirit-based, and earth interdependent legacy of the Cimarrones. And in the white dominated world of wellness gurus and culturally appropriative influencers, it's the radical Afro-Indigenous Latinx legacy that I'm uplifting with Botanica Cimarron. Botanica 
Botanica Cimarron is a project I started in 2020 after years of sharing my herbal medicine in community and organizing spaces um, for queer and trans, black, indigenous, people of color to spiritually, to spiritually connect from a decolonized lens. My mind is, is constantly bursting with new creative ideas. I wanted to create high quality and potent medicines and spiritual tools that are still made with intention and love. Botanicas are important institutions in Dominican culture, and there's always amazing treasures to be delighted by. But I also saw shelves overrun by mass market oils and waters that God knows what they were even made from. So I also wanted to cut the noise and get back to the roots of how our medicines are made. So part of what I'm doing is I'm looking back to the past as a means to stay grounded and keep reclaiming and also experimenting with new methods and ways to activate our medicine so that it feels authentic to my lived experience as a queer punk child of the city streets. So it feels like a new template. How can I reintroduce our ancient healing principles in a fresh and beautiful way that honors the imaginative spirit. I'm not interested in romanticizing the past or presenting a legible linear narrative to validate our existence. I'm interested in building a bridge to a liberated present future we all deserve to live in. And even more so on the macro scale, the Botanica functions like a business, but I very much approach it like an evolving experimental project. Being an anti-capitalist, at first I was scared of the word business. But of course, none of us created the system that we're living in. And I love the idea of creating something beautiful and functional that's widely accessible you know, and it's not just in an installation or a gallery that realistically only a few hundred people will get to experience. And branding is a visual language in and of itself that absolutely infiltrates kind of like every part of our lives <laughs> in the modern world. So I'm also seeing the possibility of being transgressive with this power. Instead of creating more let's say, meaningless shit <laughs> and hypnotizing people to believe they're not enough and thus they need to consume and consume and consume. Why not create essential tools that will connect people with their innate power and inspire a revolution of the heart? So that's how I'm hypnotizing people. <laughs> inspire the most sensitive and imaginative of us as well. That there, that, um, right? Because a lot of us that resonate with this work, we're already building the next world and we just need the power, the encouragement, the resources, the tools to keep going. So that's who my work is for. And it's a fun challenge in many ways to create something transcendent within the constraints and conditions of a modern business structure. If you approach commerce as a design principle, then you're also talking about a lineage of the marketplace, something that is as ancient as humans creating things and sharing it with others. And many of us know, and many of us know um, who aren't part of the dominant culture, that art is a part of life. It has never been separate from life. And what is life on this earth if not beauty and pain, constraints and expressions? So part of the questions I'm asking myself as I evolve the Botanica is, how can we, how can we make more space for pleasure, beauty and dreaming how can this function as a living archive of this transformational time in human history? What's happening right now that feels inspirational to a new way of living, a breaking away from the colonial worldview? And a note for many artists in this room who don't have access to, let's say, lots of money or connections. 
Um, I grew up really poor, and for me, it's really important to cultivate my own path of financial abundance that's separate from the whims of the art world and the art market, and the reality of what it means to build financial stability as an experimental installation artist is also definitely a driving force behind having, yeah, just creating an, another pathway. Um, currently, there are three, are there are three collections within the Botanica. There's plant spirit medicine. There are ritual tools and private sessions. I'm starting out with five staples in the plant spirit medicine collection that are tonics for balancing five corresponding systems in the body. Each elixir is meant to be taken internally and is a blend of herbal tinctures and flower essences. So they will both work on the energetic and physical levels for transformative holistic healing. Right, so there's one um, for the immune system, for um, the cognitive system, as well as the, you know, the reproductive or the generative system, the heart, the circulatory system, and the nervous system. This isn't merely herbalism as you know it. This is a sacred connection that transcends sim symptom soothing to target the very roots of misalignment, misalignment facilitating holistic regeneration. The key word is spirit. Connecting with the spirit of the plants is what shifts the energy. And it's, it's honestly like the only way I know how to make medicine. Not the only way, but it's the best way. When I first started brewing medicine about 13 years ago, I did a lot of wild crafting since it was mostly for myself and for my friends. But at a bigger scale, I don't think that's an ethical way to, to wild craft. So for this, line, um, I've been sourcing herbs from small farmers and mid-sized wholesalers. And this practice of plant spirit healing also translates to the ritual tools, which are completely plant-based. Um, the heart serves as a divine portal, a space where we harmonize with the universe and all of its intricacies. When we engage with plant spirits, we rediscover this. We rediscover an ancient blueprint, our innate capability to co-create with the intricate web of life. And that's what this ancestral earth-based magic is based upon. It's what it's always been about. It's been about the heart being the portal. The portal to all that is. Calling forward, the positive energies of creation to bring us into alignment. And I make um, everything myself here in the ritual tools as well, by hand and in ceremony with the earth and with the stars. So they're made in small batches and yeah, they go pretty fast because they're pretty, they're small batches. And I also made an oracle deck, which is which is all wisdom that I've gathered and channeled from the realm of ancestral plant spirits. The plants our ancient ancestors cooked with and prayed with and seeded our earth with will always continue to guide us. For those that always, that uh, may feel hesitant to work with ancestors, ancestral plant spirits is, is a grounded and rooted and very empowering pathway into ancient traditions that, um, that our whole being just intrinsically knows how to plug into. It's a direct, clear, and high vibrational access point to our lineage. It was a very long process of, of making this deck, the Green Gold Ancestral Plant Spirit Oracle deck. It took me about five years. <laughs> Didn't even know it was a deck when I started. And, um, yeah, and then it became very, very crystal clear that this was the work that needed to be channeled through me um, to share with the world. And the, the deck sold out in less than a year, but I'm bringing it back in 2024. And 
Pre-orders are available now online at botanigasimarron.com. Just, you know, a PS if you don't want to miss out. Within Botanica Cimarron, there's, um, actually, let me show some other images. Yeah, so this is another view of the Oracle deck. Um, here on the corner, you can see uh, the Cosmic Wheel, which is the system that the Oracle is based, up, is, is based upon. Um, the Cosmic Wheel, it's, it's sort of an, uh, an amalgamation of the Taino Medicine Wheel and Bakango Cosmogram. And, um, and it's like the way that you navigate um, the energetics of the plant life cycle, as well as our own cycles of transformation, um, because everything is like macro, mac micro, macro, right? So it's, it's also um, a tool for like delving deeper into the mysteries of the cycles of life and creation. No big deal, just what I think about all the time. <laughs> Probably why I'm always alone. Just kidding. Um, <laughs> with Botanica Cimarron, there's a project called Cimarron Files, which I started as a way to share my spiral, spiralic ideas of consciousness, healing, creativity, and more through writing, which I love doing. And there are some musings, are poisonous, plant medicine, um, this piece that I wrote called The Cures and the Venom. Um, there's also musings on, on, work, on connecting to queer and trans ancestors through plants. You know, um, for, for many of our lineages, those, those stories, those roles, um, they're not as accessible to us. Um, yeah because fuck transphobia and queerphobia and just all of, you know, the systems that have like ingrained and, and conditioned um, this collective forgetting. And one of, I mean, just the amazing role that plants play in our lives is um, they help to, to unlock, to unlock that ancient memory. Um, yeah. Okay, that's all I'll say about that for now. My dream has always been to make medicine and art in close connection to the land. Truly, you can plant me on a mountain in the woods away from the noise of the worlds and I'll be good. Simaharong Earth is a vision for a healing center for people, spirits, and the land. It's about regeneration, tending to the land and tending to the heart. But until I have access, uh, this is the way I'm tending to, to my little universe. Um, birth was also a part of this universe for, for a while. Um, I worked as a full spectrum doula back in New York for a couple years. Um, yeah, but I'm no longer doing that work at the moment perhaps in the, in the far future. But it's, it's definitely part of the healing arts and the healing arts pathways as I, as I understand them. And the healing arts to me is rooted in the technologies of plants, of sound, and of talismanic magic. And building new ancestral pathways means delving into spiralic forms of intuitive archeology, span or knowledge production. Mainly what that means is channeling. Channeling as a form of co-creation with the spirits of the land. How are we in dialogue? How are we um, listening and giving to the land around us? <laughs> um, I wanted to like, put in a photo that I represented channeling and I couldn't really find anything, but this is, um, yeah, this is one moment of 
Plattsburgh communication that a friend captured. And speaking of channeling, Priestessy is my musical project where I make devotional music. I'm interested in merging elements of traditional folk, doom metal, and electronic music to create visceral journeys alive with the primordial pulse of the ancient world. With my forthcoming EP, Ibid, I'm reimagining Earth and galactic myths through intimate narratives of transformation that reflect our often conflicting desires of contemporary life. Um, so it's, Priestessy has mostly been a solo project for a couple years. Um, and it started out really organically uh, with just like <coughs> me playing with sounds and with synths and channeling and recording and like, and um, seeing what came through and then performing at different noise venues. Um, and most recently, um, Priestessy is, is now banned. So yeah, it's still like pretty um, DIY, but hoping to, to share more. I, I wanted to share some music today, sorry. I know it's really enticing, but there's, there's no audio capabilities, but I wanted to. <laughs> um, okay, so I'm gonna dive into four art projects. Um, and um, yeah, so I, because I'm not able to show sound or like some of, or a lot of the video work that I've done, and also because it means we'll have more time for conversation and for questions. So just gonna dive in. Oh, and this is from a, yeah, from a performance this summer. This is another priestessy performance. This was at the kitchen. Oh, and yeah, this was another performance. I'm like, I'm forgetting. I, I don't know why I forgot I put these slides in. So <laughs> this was um, a ritual and a performance at Big Rock. Um, in, 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 in the area that's now known as Joshua Tree and Big Rock has, has um, this historic connection to the constellations and a lot of the star p people. Um, and, and I'll talk more about this um, in one of the later slides, but part of um, this particular performance and project is um, around the, like part of my inspiration was were the Agungung masquerade societies. Um, and, and I kind of delved more into it um, because it's, it's kind of, I guess, the grandparent of the lineage of the masquerades in DR and in Haiti, which are really popular um, and yeah, like masquerades as, as these cyclical collective rituals of like aligning um, the earth energies with the star energies for like greater balance in the community, right? It's, it's, it's like one of these um, cyclical collective rituals that have been maintained over time. Um, and part of like the, um, yeah, so just kind of, you know, re reawakening that energy, um, and this this particular garment that I'm wearing um, is is like featuring some of my some of my plant guides, um, some poisonous plants as well as like hibiscus and the serpents but I'll talk a little bit more about that soon. Ancient Future Signals is an exhibition presenting new sculptures and sign works um, 
it was new last spring. So this exhibition was last spring as part of my thesis. And I was exploring the question of how one copes with being alive within the most disconnected and destructive culture in human history. And thinking about my relationship to the land as a site of both structural violence, but also deep elemental healing and um, you and using the strategies of assemblage and iconography to map a new cosmology of this present moment that can offer uh, transcendent possibilities between the scientific, the intuitive, and the fantastical. So like what are new portals, new myths that can emerge from from this almost like ruinous, yeah, from the ruins. <laughs> those ruins that we find ourselves in. Um, the Seventh Direction series, which are um, the floor sculptures that are made with dirt and concrete um, and foraged herbs, as well as sand and pigments. The seventh direction series is uh, is our seven floor sculptures referencing the Bodhisa, a Taino water vessel. They're made with concrete, dirt, sand, dried glass, dried grasses, and red earth pigments, referencing the architectural materiality of the island landscape, which are handmade bull heels, plantation ruins, brick streets, and dirt roads. The the iconography of of both like male and female, so it's this like queer and trans iconography um, of the potisa speaks to the ancient two spirit symbol within Taino culture, which like the actual terms in the Taino um, language aren't surviving. Um, so I'm using. Um, yeah, the name Two Spirit um, and re resembles the contemporary heart shaped symbol that becomes the gateway of interdimensional connection. Each form is a mutation of the neck or each form. So you can see how like there's um, there's a couple of them, but they're each a uh, mutation of the necks as the neck of the potisa which is designed to protect the liquid inside from unwanted entities, travels around the surface of the form. And Blueprints is a series of sign works on blue acrylic sheets engraved with icons and prayers, offering maps and chiasmic notes to navigate the mysteries of living under structural violence. Using the materiality of connection via institutional wayfinding signs and ethernet cords, blueprints speak to the possible gateways of transcendence beyond the institutionalization that black and brown people are, fo are forced to risk just to find avenues of survival. So it's kind of using this, this form of, of, of the sign, of the institutional sign to create um, a portal that like, that you can get lost in and like find gems. So instead of finding your way in terms of a map into the institution, there's, um, there's another avenue that's opening up. And that's part of also what, um, yeah, has just been a really big influence and theme in my work is maps and the nature of maps and how they like construct our worldview um, and our idea of space. Um, and yeah, so delving into that more definitely. Um, the motifs of Brugmansia of castor, of serpents, and the Naguake Taino alphabet, among others, speak to what can grow while hidden in the dark. The buried power to dream new realities with the knowledge that disconnection with the more than human world is an illusion. Signaling to alternate connections, the chords are awaiting activation. And descent into noise, 
two halves of the human figure molded with earth and dressed with a custom garment designed for performing as priestessy, a moniker for making experimental noise music. The fragmentation of the figure speaks to also the repetitive cycles of displacement that separates us from the land. And no, it's not a Wizard of the Oz reference. Mm -hmm. And this is another view of the installation. <coughs> and most recently, I published a book with Printed Matter. It had also been many years in the making. Um, it's called When I Land had made maybe like four years in the making. Um, and a lot of it is based on um, my research in the archives, which, which like gave birth to a lot of the installations and the films and the books and like the other things that I created. And I wanted an opportunity to like, to give more focus to, to these like really violent, <laughs> things in the archive and letters, um, as well as like um, bringing in um, parts of my own family album. Through revealing the hand of the scribe and the desires of the explorer and shaping lives and reality, lived reality, When I Land seeks to collapse time, relationality, stories, and leave new identities formed and establish new ones broken. As many of us know, colonialism lives and breathes in our cells, in our psyche, taking root in the terrain of the subconscious like a spell. In an attempt to piece together parts of my ancestral past through institutional archives, I found instead twisted colonial visions within the schasms of what was pictured or written about. Through the distanced eyes of the explorers, the tourists, the scientists, as well as the unwilling migrants and salvaged fa family albums, explore the intricate weavings of a national identity. What is Dominican land? Who is a, the Dominican citizen? Um, actually, a question that is very violently contested, even on this day. What is consciously being projected forward? And what gets left behind in the shadows when identity and belonging is removed from relationship to land and from spirit and instead shaped within the white European patriarchal imagination? Can we see how the disconnection to land is essential to colonization and the formation of the Dominican national identity that's rooted in being the representation and the likeness of Spain in the new world. And that's a direct quotation. The paradigms um, from the age of discovery and romanticism that influence our way of seeing and hence our, this current worldview um, are also some of the things that I'm exploring and that I'm always thinking about. In Untitled One Through Four, I perform as a decolonial experimental archeologist. And I made up that term, in case you can't tell. I make up a lot of terms. <laughs> I'm interested in destabilizing the romantic's legacy of conquest that, rever that reverberates within land art, within land art, right? Within this discipline in art history modern art and create a world where the rebellious cartographies of the 17th century Caribbean come alive with small gestures using the iconographies of Dominican Vodou. There's the, the starry medicine bowl um, and contemporary aesthetics of countercultural resistance. As as a healer trained within various, mo various modalities, I'm continually, continuously 
Okay, English is escaping me. I'm continually tracing my ancestral knowledge systems that evade the archive. With painted stone lore and collective prophecies, this interdimensional portal serves to ignite our understanding of humanity's shared fate with the earth. In the belly of the serpent, so this is my first large scale site specific earthwork and public commission. I'm gonna share a little bit of its origin story, which I haven't really done yet. Back in 2020, I was making sculptural vessels that were inf informed by the deep chasms and scars left in the earth by mineral mines in the Dominican Republic. Um, so there's still like really active gold mines um, all over the island, you know, and as many of us know, um, gold was a huge reason for the conquest. So even today there's companies, yeah, like the Canadian Barrick Gold Mine, um, yeah, which continue very large mining operations for gold. Um, and looking at images of the earth scars, I noticed this winding shape that resembles a serpent moving across the land. And Atabe, the Taino ancestral spirit of the earth, is one of her many forms as a serpent. A serpent represents the earths because of the way that they move, hugging the dirt of the land. The serpent in Dominican and Haitian Volu is also representative of the water family of Loas, who are descendants from the West African deity, Mamiwata. And water pollution is one of the most cataclysmic effects of modern mineral mining, impacting both human communities and wildlife ecologies. Earth and water work together to provide life, and if one is poisoned, the other won't be far behind. One night I was working on a serpent-like wire and paper sculpture in the studio, and then I entered into a spontaneous trance where the spirit of an ancient serpent deity came to possess me just for a little bit. It shared with me a vision of them descending back down to the earth after many, many, many ages of being away. They were full of motherly rage and grief about the destruction and violence that was happening everywhere on earth. I've been cut open and I've returned to restore. And that's what they said. So they've risen once more. The serpent came down from the sky and from its swollen belly, it began to rain down healing waters that can restore the breath of life within the earth. Moments later, I was done with the three foot model and this understanding that this was the beginning of a greater journey. I started the UCLA MFA program with the intention, among other projects, to work more on bringing the serpent to life in an outdoor site. And, when it, and then I was approached by land, the Los Angeles Nomadic Div Division, to bring the serpent to the Los Angeles State Historic Park. I was like, oh wait, this is perfect. And it just, just all made sense. Um, because in the park, um, it, it, it was part of the site of the Sanja Madre, um, the Sanja Madre, and um, so, so it's an earthen aqueduct which provided water from the river for a growing pueblo soon to be known as Los Angeles. And it was once located um, just about I don't know, like maybe a hundred feet down, right there along the the train tracks, right below. That's where the aqueduct for um, for this land was. So, responding to this rich history of the Riverlands, my intention was for the mud-built serpent to call attention to our interconnectedness with the cycles of the earth and embodying, embodying the symbols of rebirth in the belly of the serpent creates sacred space for visitors to reflect on what they're ready to transmute within the core of the serpent and what they're ready to dream into reality within the fertile, watered soil. 
The center point of the serpent is both an earth mound and an enlarged belly. Imagining the cauldron of life within the belly of earth, within the belly of creation, clogged up by the systems of extraction that exploit natural resources and the light forces of, rendered, of gendered and racialized oppressed peoples, were tasked with aiding in the healing of the Great Mother. Growing up in the US, I understood that I was living in the belly of the beast. The Dominican Republic was invaded by the US and this country's policies and capitalistic decisions are still influencing the lives of many to migrate or flee their native lands in search of a chance at life, just like, just like my parents did in the late 1980s. And of course, we're also seeing um, the, the tentacles of this empire um, in, in Gaza. And on this land, there is a living legacy of displacement as well. The National Parks and the Bureau of Land Management was founded on the auspices, auspicious, of ecological protection while displacing indigenous peoples and creating large reserves for the US government to extract minerals and control water rays. Another way in which I'm thinking about the space of the belly is one of volcanic intensity, where various threads of connection finally meet in the center to be forged into new shapes. So how does our cultural disconnection to the land fuel the beast and, its, and the underbelly of empire? We reclaim our power. This was more of the belly. We reclaim our power when we remember that that which poisons us can also heal us, right? So there is also power from this position of being in the belly. And I'm activating Afro-Iowak power plants and mystic symbols throughout the surface of the serpent as healing gateways for new stories to emerge. As a keeper of our medicine traditions within the Caribbean folk healing, I understand power plants to be a triple force, right? So it's the power to heal, the power to conjure, as well as um, the power to nourish our bellies. And I'm using these protective, oh yeah. So I'm using the protective Bija Orellano, that's also, um, let's see, it's also known as achiote, um, anato seed, um, to paint afro arawak symbols of, and uh, sometimes as I use Arawak and Taino interchangeably, yeah, um, of, of elements throughout the surface of the serpent. I'm interested in working with Afro-Indigenous knowledge systems and the aesthetics of prehistoric land art to call upon a time when art was more integrated into the fabric of society and ancient civilizations across the world made earthen formations in service to the ongoing story of creation. I'm interested in what can emerge from the ruins of colonialism and this current era of human and capital domination. And this is Irka Mateo, uh, another amazing artist um, and medicine person, uh, uh, yeah, a healer, an elder that um, I work with a lot worked with over the years and it's now um, also in Los Angeles and Irka is leading the, the activation ceremony on the opening night. Um, <clears throat> so this work is about a repair of our world that requires our imagination. Now that we've all been forced to um, and of course not all of us, <laughs> now that um, we've been forced to this part of the world in the belly of the empire, especially as, you know, as, as people of African ancestry, how do we build fresh roots and sprout new seeds? And how are we also, yeah, how, how are we contending with this? Um, So those are some of the things that I think about. And this is 
also from the activation ceremony. Feel free to, to stay in touch with me. Um, I also, I was going to offer everyone a 20% discount because I'm offering, because I'm opening up my sessions, but I didn't make a, a discount code <laughs> in time. So just email me or um, I'll also send the info to Ray who can send it out to folks. Um, and yeah, thank you so much for having me, everyone. Thank you for listening. memory um, the, about the so much that has been forgotten in our families, etc. And the reason I'm saying thank you is because as people of color, as the children of colonialism, we are encouraged and expected and ma manipulated into forgetting. Mm -hmm. And it is so beautiful to see your work um, that taps into remembering, reconjuring, reconnecting, ancestrality, spirituality, all that we were, that it was intended we should be separated from. And to see you tapping into that um, is just so beautiful um, because conquered people, we carry that in our genes and in ourselves. And and it's important for us to remember so that we can connect. There is a reason why culture was banned mm -hmm. for oppressed people because culture is a powerful thing that unites. And, and in hearing you speak, um, it wasn't just about the Dominican Republic. I'm speaking as a Dominican. Um, it, it's also diasporic because through culture, we connect and we understand. And also, I love what you're doing with the herbs and everything because for those who don't know, everybody in the Dominican Republic, yes. either rural or urban, Everyone's an herbalist. is a doctor. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> you go and everywhere you go, whether it's on the streets, in the park, or whatever, people, if you say you feel something, people have yeah. the remedy for it. And, and it's really important thing to cherish and to preserve that not everything has to be bought in a store. Um, and so it's just beautiful to see the work that you do. And just, it was so, I believe in, I say the spirits guide us. And I'm like, I, I, I'm sure there's a reason why the spirits brought me here. But interestingly enough, the, this was supposed to be a secret, but the Afro Festival, which happens in April here, the theme is Cimarrones. Ah, it's, mira eso. It's Maroons, <laughs> Dreamers, and Visionaries. Mm. Because it's all connected. And, mm -hmm. and you brought every aspect of that, of Cimarronaje, dreaming, rebels, visionaries, to the forefront. It is in our blood. And, and mm -hmm. just thank you. I just wanted to say thank you. Mm, thank you. Thank you. So I'm working with uh, the medios as well in my art practice um, that come from my grandmother. And I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit more about, um, you talked about like being sacred and secret. And so, because I know that there's this very, um, you know, special knowledge that my grandmother had that um, came from different places from both my um, Spanish ancestors and my indigenous ancestors. And so I, I just want to hear a little bit more on how you navigate you know, the sacredness of what you're working with um, and um, sharing, so sharing the, the secret. Um, I'd like to hear a little bit more about that. Yeah, that's a great question. Yeah, because I, I, I wonder, like, am I resilient? Yeah, those are great questions to ask. 
say this is not a advertisement for smart water. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, there's so much that I don't share. <laughs> I'm also a very private person kind of naturally. So I just, I don't know, I kind of don't. Um, yeah, so there's a lot that I don't share. And I know that my role is, is to share the tenets of, of, of our medicine, of our technologies, of our world's view, but not, not, not everything, right? Like the tenants, there it's, it's, it's more of the foundations. Um, and yeah, and it's also not like willy nilly, right? It's, it's just like who, whoever's like ready to receive it. Um, and yeah, and I think, you know, like also to piggyback on your comment of like spirit guiding us, right? Like, um, spirit also guides me to like, to share what needs to be shared in this moment. And, you know, like, will will show me, like, will teach me like what, what um, is ready to be revealed and so on. So um, those are really, really important questions that definitely, you know, I say, ask yourself, ask of your guides, ask of your elders. Um, and yeah, and I don't know, does that feel clear? Mm. Okay. Yeah. Hey. Hey. <laughs> so I, I'm just like really struck by your presentation for a number of reasons. Uh, besides, I mean, some of your comments, besides it really sounding poetic and beautiful, are so profound. And one of the things I'm trying to remember, I was going to write everything down, but I couldn't write fast enough. Uh, you mentioned sort of the violence in the archive, and I was like, oh, yeah, that's a colonial thing. The archive made me think as a colonial art historian, like what kinds of knowledge are considered legitimate and which kinds are considered illegitimate. And from a early European colonial <coughs> standpoint, the written word, you know, what was considered legitimate. Other forms of knowledge making, you know, that were more experiential, performative, ritual, were considered superstitious, you know, non-Christian, diabolical. And it, that becomes a tool for the kind of forgetting, mm -hmm. the erasure, that was so calculated and intentional, you know, and, and I, I work in the archive a lot, and all of the, uh, when you look at colonial history and the kind of work that you're talking about, you know, there are like a sequence uh, of violent actions against certain co uh, communities, and, the, and it's the archive where those ideas are, 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 are stored, you know, and, and there is violence. I've gone through so many uh, cases where I've come across documents that really are difficult to kind of process, you know, as I'm trying to understand what happened and why it happened. And as an art historian, what was the role of visual culture as a tool of colonialism? What my courses are about how to understand how art registers these things or how it occludes and erases things. Mm -hmm. You know, so I just thought that was really profound, you know, the, the, that comment of violence in the archive, because it really is a core of so much of what it is you're talking about, this thing that we misremember or completely forget and what you're doing is trying to retrieve that as you are noting it's kind of more intuitive kind of spiritual kind of reconnecting real you use these verbs reawakening da, 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 that really is completely counter to sort of the colonial systems that were forced upon so many of our communities and to me that's like such a powerful thing you know, you're not just creating objects that are aesthetic you know you're creating things that are living mm -hmm. you know they're, they're living things uh, that are more than just about conversations in the contemporary art world. You know, they're historical, they're living, they're cultural, they're communal, and they're healing. And these kinds of things are intended to kind of heal mm -hmm. the traumas that many of us from certain communities just live with every day. You know, so it, this is, I, I think it's brilliant. I love this thing. And the last thing I'm going to say is, did I mishear, did you say that Chris Ducey was banned? Oh, is is a band. Oh, is a band. Yeah, I got oh, a band. Uh, <laughs> okay. 
Um, yeah. Oh, and also one thing, I remember, back to your comment, I mean, to your question, there's also a lot that I don't know. <laughs> and that, you know, I'm always learning um, and like will be learning for the rest of my life. So definitely like, I don't know everything. <laughs> um, and I've, I've, I've like, I've worked on the other side of the archive as well. I, I've, I've worked in um, collections management as an intern and in, um, yeah, you know, different like African art history collections um, in like a curatorial internship role. Um, and they're really heavy, you know, as like a really sensitive, empathic, intuitive person, it's like, you know, there's, there's, yeah, there's all these living beings <laughs> that are, you know, marked in numbers and tags and like wrapped in plastic bags. Um, and, and, and it's just like static, right? There's a lot more that I could say about that and about that time. But um, it's, it's also like one of the reasons why I started thinking about this term living archives, right? And like, because, because yes, like archives are institutional, but but if we like think about archives as as storage spaces for memory, right? Like that concept and and in the way that that, that exists, like it's it's ancient and it's expanded and it's like beyond the the concepts of, of space and time, right? So also thinking about like ceremony as a living archive, thinking about um, um, our bodies as living archive. Thinking about, um, yeah, um, like the like allowing for our relationship with with knowledge, knowledge systems, and knowledge production to be continuously innovating, dying, and living, and forming, and changing, and like and and messy, you know, <laughs> yeah, dirty. Yes. Okay, cool. Um, I'm feeling kind of like struck as a fellow Dominican who um, has, like, I am um, the product of colonization in that um, my, you know, my tie to the Dominican Republic is through a Protestant. is the only word that I can think of it because I'm hearing some of these things for literally the first time. Mm. And I find that to be, like, I, I feel, I guess, like, I do have a question that's attached to this, I'm not just <laughs> I'm talking, but um, I guess, like, I am beginning this <coughs> process of um, acknowledging the grief and mourning of what I have lost. Um, and also what my ancestors have lost. And it, I wonder how you move with your grief and also with your, um, your reignition in a colonially like, structured space of academia. And I guess how you Mm -hmm. Yeah, a lot's coming up. Um, so let me try to remember. In terms of academia, you know, I've like whizzed in and out. I wouldn't say I'm like in academia, you know, have definitely um, looted everything that I can. <laughs> um, but I don't know if I'm like, yeah, sure. Um, it's, it's, yeah, it's definitely a dance in terms of, um, I'm trying to remember in terms of grief. Um, actually, part of the reason why I also just felt really called to make this work, um, like, um, 
yeah, I, I've I've been in this deep process of healing for a really, really, really long time, and and I just felt like okay, like a lot of like I'm attracted to beauty and beauty as a tool to um, beauty as a tro- as the Trojan horse, right? <laughs> to get people to um, yeah kind of like honey to like make the medicine go down smoother, right? So it's kind of an opening, an invitation. Um, And I'm saying this because um, there's always been this like kind of gothic beauty and horror like around my work. Um, And yeah, a lot of themes around like pain and trauma and colonialism. And I'm like, okay, I'm like ready to kind of close this chapter, (laughs) to be honest. Um, So, yeah, I'm like, I kind of need to take a big metaphorical shit in this kind of way and, um, and, and allow for, um, for all of these stories, all of these, um, all of these, all all of these faces, all of these, like everything that I've been learning and experiencing and taking in to be um, transformed, transmuted into something else so that I could move forward and create from a new kind of space, right? Because I needed to be in that space, I did, for, for many years. Um, and, and yeah, and I also understand like, um, where you're coming from in, in terms of maybe only uh, hearing a lot of this for the first time. Cause like, like we're, I think that's part of the really particular poison to that kind of, that is circulating. Um, yeah, just a lot of things, right? Like. For example, like when people, when like Dominicans come up in public conversation, it's usually like, oh my God, they don't know they're black or they're really racist or like, or this or that or really backward. And it's like, but like, what does it mean to be the first to experience the wrath of Columbus, Mm -hmm. to be the first to also like, to be stoked? Like, what does it mean? to write to have like the first blacks in the Americas. What does it mean for like, for the state of Spain to be so absolutely entrenched in, um, in everything, right? In, in, in like the identity of, of how the nation sees itself, right? Not everyone sees themselves that way, but that's, but that's a narrative. Um, and I think it's important for people to know more about this because this is that's this is the experiment that created this. So <laughs> don't know really how else to say that. So it's deep. It's deep yeah. shit. <laughs> it really is. Yeah, I have so much more questions. Yeah. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Um, thank you so much, Katya. Uh, my question has to do with sound and music because that's my field. Mm-hmm. And I'm so sorry. Go back to that. I'm happy because I was able to play what you wanted to play. But as Ooh. we were talking, I was trying to imagine. I was trying to imagine your voice in music. And as we were talking, I was also trying to imagine the connection between your devotion of music and healing and prophecy. Um, so if, if you don't mind, I would love for you to at least describe uh, sonically. Um, what's happening, and if you would use uh, voice, if you use uh, lyrics, and uh, how do you see the connection between sound or music or noise <clears throat> and healing? Mm-hmm. Mm, thank you. Thank you for that question. Um, yeah, it's also it's it's also like interconnected, right? Sound is so incredibly healing. Um, sound is is a medium. Sound like vibration is is the matter that like that creates everything that um that creates form that kind of like holds it 
to you know, not really hold it together. But um, yeah, and it's honestly like this area is, is where I'm putting in um, a lot of like my creative energy right now and like making um, new songs and performances. It's what feels really exciting and it's like pulling me forward. And um, in terms of the relationship, I'm trying to remember your question. Sorry, can you? The relationship between sound and healing and maybe describing like if you use lyrics or if you just reference the mental music, like to have a sense, a sonic sense of, of what you do. Yeah, so, um, so I'm, I'm writing lyrics. Um, a lot of it, um, I'm kind of, a lot of it's spontaneous channeling. I'll just kind of like, I don't know, be outside or in the kitchen or somewhere. And then um, something will strike me and I'll like record a voice memo. And then I'll come back to it and kind of tease it out and like do more writing and develop it over time. And um, a lot of them are also like very, like, like they're, um, yeah, they're, um, their visions as well. Um, and so the kind of the style of um, the kind of lyrics that I write, they're very folk like, they're very, um, very interested in like religious chants and like, and the form of the religious chant, right? Like the, the Gregorian chant, um, you know, cause like those are some of the ones that I know. Um, and and of course, like the folk music that I'm just familiar with and like grew up around, as well as like the folk music um, from American artists and from around the world. So there's like just music that comes like it's this vi vibrational frequency of like coming up from the earth and coming through the heart. Um, and that's part of like the definition um, of culture as well, right? It's 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 kind of like cultures develop because of this 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 very like magnetic real connection that we have to the land, and like that's why like you know music in different places like sounds different. It's because it's like responding to the frequencies of the area. Um, Okay, I feel like I'm rambling. Um, okay, so noise. Noise is really important. <laughs> um, my first album, my first EP was like mostly noise. Um, this new body of work is more produced. Um, but I want to talk about noise um, in terms of like um, that similar energy of the volcano, of like the dark matter, of like needing to go through the mystery to become undone and to create something new. Um, yeah, I think that's why, that's why like, you know, the space like the queer club and like the DIY punk venue, like that's why it's, it's always been so healing and so powerful for me. Just like, um, you know, a lot of the artists that I love and like, that are my friends, like dream crusher. I'm like, I don't know if you know, but like you're opening up portals. And yeah. Um, yeah, I feel like I didn't answer that so well, but those are some of the things that are happening. Um, yeah. Maybe one more question or comment? It kind of, you know, it brought me back to being a kid and driving by, and it was in the park before. It used to be a cornfield, and that's where yeah. the LA Powell used to happen. Um, mm. So I'm thinking a lot about um, the sculpture and how, you know, you use the space as a site, you know, after being kind of a site of memory, right? Um, <laughs> and also kind of thinking, too, about, because in LA, we're, we're talking a lot about <coughs> Right, so thinking mm -hmm. about your serpent as like a monument of like dreaming and reconnecting, right? 
Um, can you share a little bit about that process of like what it means to you to have your work out in the public and having you know just different type of engagement, whether that's with people or whether that's with like plant and you know our animal relatives? There? It's wild. <laughs> it's wild. Um, yeah, it's it's taught me a lot. It's 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 like. I've learned a lot, you know, um, I've grown a lot. It's, it's also, I feel like the first thing that, that really came up for me when they asked me to do this just felt like such a huge honor, which honestly, I was like, I don't know if I'm the one to do this, you know, like there, I'm, um, at this point, I had only been in LA for three years, you know, and, um, so I'm still like building relationship with the land and yeah, I'm still like grounding and um, yeah, but it, um, so yeah, it's kind of wild. It's a big honor and, and, it, and it, I feel like the biggest affirmation has come from just watching people interact with it and he seeing and hearing their reactions. And like before this, like, um, so the park, it's a pretty big art site um, in LA. Like there's permanent and public art sculptures like all over. Um, but this site, like there's never been um, any work on this and while I was building it um, and there's and there was also a team of like of of other artists and community members and folks just you know in the park just coming to help us because they wanted to and everyone would be like oh my god I'm so happy there's something here and like well it's so cool um, you know and 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 having people also like connect with um, yeah, I guess like as like as an Afro Latinx artist, um, you know, it's there. There isn't. Um, it feels pretty important <laughs> that this work is 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 in this site as well because, um, yeah, there just 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 aren't a lot um, of us so. Yeah, and I'm also, I feel like the biggest thing was letting go of control, letting go of, of, of expectations. Um, the work is also like, while it's very sturdy and structural, it's also ephemeral, you know, and it's not meant to be permanent. Um, and, Parts of the materials are resistant to the rain, but it's not like, it's not waterproof. So part of it, you know, it's also like this continuing cycle, right? This living cycle of like, it's, it's, it's eroding. <laughs> it's also becoming a ruin. Yeah. Okay, well, I think that's it for this evening. Thank you so much for coming.